And with that, the season is over. The WCC uh, basketball season has come to a close with Gonzaga's loss in the Elite Eight to UConn. And and what a what a ride it was for for the Zags. It's been a crazy season overall. It's to an extent there's like a a sense of relief when it's finally all over, but also obviously a great sense of just like disappointment, sadness, because that means college basketball is largely over for uh, the WCC fandom. Yes, we do still have the final four coming up this week. Um, and that'll always, that's always fun to watch. Uh, getting to see someone like FAU being in the final four is always fun. Um, and UConn has been, lights out to this point in the tournament obviously both st mary's and gonzaga can attest to that um but here we are season is over gonzaga season has finally come to an end st mary's run ended a week ago and we can close the book on the 2022 23 season and as we start to wrap it up, uh, we'll I'll get into some letter grades for each of the teams, uh, each of the ten teams. Uh, later on in the show, also talk to uh, Josh Linky uh, at the Zagaholic. Uh, we'll talk to him about just the the finality of the season for Gonzaga, what it looks like for them going forward, um, and just some perspective on what this season has meant uh, for the program, and then also. Um, what it looks like going forward. Uh, before we get to Josh, um, I'm going to do my own recap of what we saw over the weekend from Gonzaga and really just kind of taking a step back and thinking about the season that they had. So I'll start with uh, the Sweet 16 game on Thursday, Gonzaga and UCLA. We knew going in that these two have had some classics over the years. Again, Think back all the way to 2006 with Adam Morrison. We can think back just a few couple of years with Jalen Suggs in the Final Four. And this game did not disappoint on that front. Uh, Gonzaga and UCLA gave us another classic, another night to remember in the NCAA tournament with a shot to remember in the NCAA tournament. Gonzaga got down early by 13. UCLA was playing really well uh, there in the first half. Gonzaga made a run in the second and even ended up uh, up 10 there late in the second half with like two minutes to go. And UCLA stormed back to even take a lead uh, with just seconds remaining. And then Gonzaga ran what is essentially the, the, uh, the Jay Wright play that we saw at the end of the of the Villanova's last championship the the Chris Jenkins shot which now has which now you can utilize as the Julian Strother shot and he took a hand off right on the base of the lo- the the edge of the logo the March Madness logo there on center court pulled up from 3 with with no hesitation drills it and gives us the lasting memory of another Gonzaga uh, win in dramatic fashion against UCLA. Strother adds his name in front of his hometown crowd in Vegas uh, to just these another incredible win for that program, another incredible win for uh, another incredible moment for March Madness in general. Um, and it was. That's what you want from a college basketball game. That was like the peak of what you want to see, uh, what what March Madness is all about. The excitement of that moment, the excitement, the excitement of the end of that game was incredible. Uh, there's not a whole lot you can like. You can really like like on an entertainment value alone. It was just so fun to watch. Uh, Drew Timmy was dominating in that game. Thirty six points, fourteen rebounds. It was his tenth. 20 plus point game in the NCAA tournament, which now he, he is the sole record holder on that front. And going into the elite eight matchup with UConn, I, and I talked about 
uh, this last week of like, I thought we were going to get another classic from UCLA Gonzaga. We did. And then I thought that the run would end against UConn. That was what happened, but I could not have predicted in the way it happened. I could not have predicted that UConn would win by 28. I could not have predicted that Gonzaga would go two for 20 from three point range. I could not have predicted they would have gone 12 for 22 from the free throw line. I could not have predicted they would shoot 24% in the second half. And this is not a, I think this is less a criticism what of Gonzaga and more just how good UConn is. Each of their games have been by double digits. Their closest game was actually the game against St. Mary's, and that was a 15-point um, spread. This UConn team is, as advertised, does look like the team that was the number one team in the country for the better half of the first part of the season. And it's a crushing way for it to end for the Zags. A crushing way, really, for the the Drew Timmy era in Spokane. He already had announced that obviously this was going to be his last season. Uh, he announced that in the last game in Spokane, that this was going to be it for him. And it came to a screeching halt and a screeching halt very quickly in that second half against UConn it became very clear that Gonzaga was not going to be able to come back from this. And it's always a weird feeling. Again, like I talked about this weird feeling after the St. Mary's loss. That when it's over, it's just over. And it's it's a mixed bag of feelings of like the of sadness, frustration, almost an emptiness once the season ends. And but that's where but that's where Gonzaga fans are today little bit of this, like, what do I do now? This, But if I take a step back and think about what this season was for that team, like, they had an incredible year. Again, when you, when you can have your season end in the Elite Eight, I don't think there's much more you could ask for. Uh, this was a team that maybe initially had a few national title contenders tension conversation still happening, but it wasn't nearly as strong as it was a year ago. Uh, this was a team that looked like it was struggling there in January, February, or well, I could say like December, January. Uh, you know, thinking about all the way back to when they lost to LMU, then they lost to St. Mary's and it seemed like the sky was falling. They barely beat USF. They barely beat Santa Clara. They barely beat, uh, a lot of these, a lot of WC uh, barely beat BYU. And it was like, what is happening with this Gonzaga team? But what we saw is that they just got better and better and better over the course of the year. We saw the growth of, saw just more growth from Anton Watson. We saw Malachi Smith figure out his role in this, on this team. We saw more growth from Hunter Salas. We saw Drew Timmy compete continue to be his dominant self. We saw this Gonzaga team start to play better defense, much better defense than what we saw earlier in the year. And I think you could, I don't now for me, I don't think the run was totally unexpected. I still going into the tournament thought this team was still a second weekend team. Maybe it looked a little dicey there in January, uh, but by the time we got to February, late February, it was very clear that this Gonzaga team was not the same team we saw in Jan a month prior. That this team was playing its best. That this team was pl that ha seemed to be clicking on all cylinders. And you get to the second weekend, and I think you can clearly say, especially for a program like Gonzaga, it's like, that was a success. An eighth straight year in the Sweet 16. I believe it was the fifth Elite Eight in the last eight years for this program. And yes, they did fall short of the Final Four. They fell short against a team that 
clear, looks like the clear favorite to to win the whole thing now. And it's diff, it's now time to kind of have that that retrospective look and think about what this team was as a whole. And also, I think in this stage, it's also what Drew Timmy meant for Gonzaga, what Drew Timmy is going to be remembered for. I think as as a legacy piece in college basketball, because he you very arguably like he was one of the few like faces across the sport that everyone recognized. Everyone know knew who Drew Timmy was. Whether it be for like his his podcast or the comments that he or his interviews and his and some of his uh bite uh clippable quotes that you could point to or whether it be the mustache or any number of things that like made drew timmy just a staple for the college basketball fan over the last four years like it's going to be hard to not have him in the conversation with some of the greatest players ever yes he doesn't have the championship so maybe that does knock him down a little bit on that front but when you think about some of the names that he's now surrounded by when it comes to tournament performances. I was, cause I was looking at it and this one didn't happen, but he is now one of 10 guys to ever have 300 or more points in the NCAA tournament 10. And the list of the 10 is, is like a who's who of college basketball. I mean, we can, it's the likes of Tyler Hansbro. It's Christian Leitner. Uh, the number, the the guys that he joined in a right around him: Corliss Williamson, Bill Bradley, uh, Lou Alcindor, Kareem, uh, Glenn Rice. You have so many guys that are household college basketball names, household NBA names that he is now surrounded by, and that is the legacy he's going to leave again. He played in three NCAA tournaments, did not get to play in the first one because of COVID. And that was, and he played in a national title game, the Sweet 16, and he got to the Elite Eight. I think if you asked any college basketball player, any star college basketball player, uh, if that's the career that they would finish with, I'm sure that almost every last one of them would take it and and be incredibly happy with it. And yes. The, a championship didn't happen. And that might be the one thing you can point to that he didn't do, but he checked every other box. He was, he changed, he continued and solidified the dynamic of Gonzaga as a national con title contender. After the 2017 run, this was, this got, this guy became the anchor of that next wave. Uh, for this team, and they were in it every single year. You had you couldn't exclude Gonzaga because because they had the best big man in the sport, and he was the best big man in sport for largely the last three years. And there'll be plenty of time to kind of talk about where he fits in. It, is he? I think he's very clearly Gon the best player ever at Gonzaga. Yes, he's already the all-time leading scorer, and because he just because it's not just the success on the court. Because you can go talk about all of that, but also just his general impact on the the image that the program had. Because yes, the the twenty seventeen team elevated Gonzaga to that level. But even that team didn't necessarily have like the one guy that you could point to of being like the the overall recognizable star in college basketball. Drew Timmy was that. Drew Timmy's maybe was the the biggest quote star for a Gonzaga team, maybe since Adam Morrison. And I think that's that's the level of importance and value that Drew Timmy has had for for Gonzaga and and before I get too much too further that much farther into it I do want to bring in uh Josh Linky we'll talk with him about what what Drew Timmy meant what this season has meant and all and all that 
All right, it's great to have Josh Linke at the Zagaholic uh, back on the show. Uh, Josh, thanks for hopping on. Rough loss for Gonzaga, rough way to end the season. Uh, but taking a step back and thinking about what this season was as a whole, uh, what's what's kind of like your initial just takeaways from what this team was able to accomplish, thinking about the kind of the ups and downs, especially a lot of more than we're used to seeing from this team. Uh, what's what's kind of being what's your initial takeaway from what we saw this year? Yeah, uh, well, thanks for having me, first of all. But, um, you know, this I feel like Gonzaga exceeded expectations, um, maybe not from the beginning of the season, you know, when they opened top five in the country or whatnot, but certainly from December, November, some of the lulls in the early season, maybe even right around the time of that LMU loss at home, snapping the, the, you know, home winning streak. Um, you know, there was a lot of fans, a lot, a lot of Zag fans on Twitter who were absolutely just, this team sucks. They're going to lose in the first, second round. Like there's no way this team's going to get to the second weekend again. And yet here we were uh, with, with just an insane performance to beat, TCU in the second half and secure an eight straight sweet 16 and then equally or or actually I should say not equally because it was it was an all-timer finish to a game against UCLA again you know we're talking yeah. what three uh tournament it's four tournament games versus them now but three epic finishes yeah. one way or the other between these teams and you know Julian Strother in front of his his hometown uh, cements his legacy with one of the most beautiful finishing shots uh, to win a game in, in my opinion, in Gonzaga history. Um, you know, and I just, I feel blessed to be honest, like overall, like, you know, am I sad that we couldn't, you know, handle UConn? Uh, absolutely. It was a, it was about as bad of a performance as I think I've ever seen Gonzaga lay in the NCAA tournament. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, like, um, it, it's heartbreaking, but I also recognize the, the growth, the development that this program made over this season, uh, in a year when a lot of people questioned whether Mark few was even capable of that, or whether that was a Tommy Lloyd thing from, you know, a relic of, of past seasons mm -hmm. and Mark few proved everybody wrong. Like he, he developed. I, I would honestly say this may be his best development job as a coach in his 24, whatever it is, years at this point at the helm. Um, and I think that, you know, we, we have to take a step back and look at that and just say, yeah, this dude proved without a shadow of a doubt, he's the Hall of Fame mind behind the program that's put Gonzaga in the position to even be here. Um, you know, none of this Tommy Lloyd was the brains behind the operation stuff anymore. Like that's, that's just a complete fallacy. So yeah, I, it's a mixed bag of emotions at this point. Obviously we are <laughs> less, we were 12 hours, if, if even that away from right. uh, the results of last night's game, but you know, whatever, here we are. <laughs> exactly. And as even, I mean, I think about just how impressed, because I think about this tournament run and, and we saw toward as you kind of pointed out, they got seemed just to seem get better and better and better as the year went on. Yes, they had that lull right around December, January, lose to LMU, lose to St. Mary's. It almost seemed like the sky was falling to an extent. Mm -hmm. uh, and this team just it you could just see like the confidence grow in them after almost at the point of the St. Mary's game and that first matchup in Moraga and moving on from that just seemed like their, their confidence has seemed to grow and grow and grow. They, they were a lot more in sync with each other. The defense was much better after that point um, collectively. And I think that's, you, as you talk about that development, like we got to see that more and more. Um, and yeah, like that UCLA game was an all timer. Another one between these two teams. Like I, that was just an amazing finish. Like just the, the fact that the Zags were able to come back after after halftime, they got up by ten. UCLA found a way to come back in the last couple minutes, uh, yeah. and yeah, just it it was funny. I was like, I was as as Strother hit that shot. I was 
I was thinking everyone in Provo just cringed at that. <laughs> that is the <laughs> mere image of that shot in the Marriott Center. Uh, yeah. And, but looking at this year, because I think the one of the things it almost seems like we're coming to the end of an era here with the Zags because this is the end of Drew Timmy and he's going to be uh, moving on to the pros after this year. And I mean, we could talk about every superlative about him being one of the best big men, if not the best big man in the college game, the last few years, he's obviously an all timer at Gonzaga, if not the all timer at Gonzaga, what's, sure. what's, what's going to be his legacy or what like in your mind right now is the legacy he leaves, not only obviously in at Gonzaga in the WCC, but also college basketball as a whole. Cause it like, he's on every all time list at this point. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to quantify the impact that drew Timmy has made on this program because there, there are so many, uh, so many accolades that he's accumulated at this point, whether it be awards or broken records or, you know, just the sheer number of heights that the program achieved during his time with the program. Um, you, you could make an argument that Timmy is the greatest Zag of all time at this point, uh, you know, simply from the perspective that the longevity, the loyalty to the program, um, you know, he made some comments last night um, following the loss to UConn about, you know, his place in the program and where he sees himself and, and whatnot. And, and he, he said it, in my opinion, the best way possible, which is to say that, you know, he, he doesn't necessarily care about all the, the accolades and the records and everything. What he cares about is the fact that this program is home for him now. You know, he was questionable originally about even going to school thousands of miles away from home from texas you know coming all the way out to the pacific northwest but along the way he found a second father in mark few which you know you say what you will about mark and, and we you know we already talked about that a little bit but um, their bond their friendship it just proves the level of family that this program has and I think that Drew personifies that a little bit, like just in his his undying love for the program at this point. You know, um, he's been here for four. He was a true senior, four years, played every single year as a contributing member for the program, the last three as a starring member for the program. And, you know, unfortunately lost a year to COVID. Um, or rather the, the tournament to COVID, but he still somehow has finished. What, what is it? Uh, I think he, after last night, he's like 11th or 10th or something I, in I top believe it's most points. 10, 10 on the most. Yeah. And one, now one of only 10 with 300 or more in the, in NCAA tournament games. Right. And then he also set the record for the most uh, games with 20 or more points in the yeah. tournament had, having already been tied with, guys like uh Corliss Williamson and wasn't it Kareem on that list Bill, too? Like, Bill I mean, Bradley it's a the yeah. list is the list is incredible yeah and and that just shows like you know this is a guy who he he showed up when the 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 bright the lights were brightest he arrived on the scene and he just never relented like his desire to win was you know second to none and I think that just speaks to uh, where Gonzaga is at as a program, you know, like we could, we could have the discussion, like, is this the end of an era or is this just the beginning of a different era? Like we're, you know, we, I think a lot of people thought after the 2017 national title run, uh, where, you know, where we fell short and Nigel left and all that, like, well, well, that's probably, that's probably the pinnacle for Gonzaga. Like that's not going to happen. And then, you know, sure enough, a few, a few years later, here mm -hmm. we are again. Um, and I just think it, it, it speaks to like, coach few is evolving you know he's he's trying to uh you know integrate new ideas and concepts with the team every year like i don't i don't i don't necessarily see it as as the end of a run more so just the end of timmy's run mm -hmm. yeah i i i agree with that. yeah definitely when i say that it's more like the end of like it's the end of the drew timmy era like because obviously gonzaga's extended this run it's like and it's the the idea of the championship window and what exactly that looks like, because you can obviously right. we can go to tw back to 2017 and really ever since then, they've kind of been at least in the conversation 
every single year since then. Even at the beginning of this year, I think there were still some people, even despite losing uh, Chet Holmgren, despite losing Andrew Nevhard, that conversation was still there because you had Drew Timmy. Yeah. But now as you kind of like start to roll into next year and start to think about where this team is going, because it's going to look probably very different going into the next year. Obviously, you know you that Drew Timmy will be gone. We know that Rashir Bolton uh, is out of out of eligibility, so he'll be gone. There's a likelihood that Julian Strother will, will follow the path and go and jump to the NBA. Same could be said for Anton Watson. So this could be, a, this team could look very different going in the next year. Absolutely. And what's, what's, what's kind of like the, I guess the, 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 the way too early prospectus or the outlook of maybe what this Gonzaga team is going into next year. Yeah. So we're definitely going to lose amazing talent across the board. And, and there is a question mark about whether Anton, uh, will come back or Malachi Smith potentially coming back. Um, if they're both back, that bodes well for this team being potentially a top four seed again. You know, I don't know if they're going to be making a national title run, but certainly a tournament run of some sort. Um, but, you know, yeah, the, the big question mark for this tournament and going forward is guard play. Um, you know, we we all witnessed what was – uh, kind of it's i don't want to i don't want to rag too much but kind of a collapse of sorts uh for gonzaga starting backcourt during this march um and and there was a period where malachi smith and hunter salas came off the bench and kind of like you know gave us a glimmer of hope but um you know now going forward you you have to wonder like is mark going to try to hit the portal and um you know maybe grab a couple of more seasoned vets to um, shore up the backcourt or is he going to rely on on nolan hickman hunter salas um hopefully malachi smith to spearhead the backcourt and then uh incoming four-star freshman um dusty stromer from california who actually just wrapped up a state title in california um and you know i i think i think there's a lot of talent there it's just it's a matter of letting it develop and grow and see how it progresses but you know, yeah, the, the portal is going to be an interesting thing to watch for the next couple months. Right. I think the port, I mean, the portal has definitely changed a lot in the last couple of years. And some teams as, as the tournament is very clear on, it's that you can get the pieces and put something together very quickly. We look at Kansas, what we look at Kansas state, Florida Atlantic, and some of the things that they've done, San Diego state, what they've been able to add. So we know that uh, you can build fast and build a cohesive team that can do well in the tournament through the portal. Um, yeah. As we start to kind of like think about, because I'm starting to think of some of the guys that are, that I, that I think are going to be really good going in the next year for Gonzaga. It's like one of the guys that just was jumping out to me more and more as the season went along. And the same could be said for um, a number of other people who saw him play was Hunter Salas just, just looked like he was just getting better and better and better as the year went on. And, and obviously, like he was one of the more highly touted guys coming in when he came in as a freshman a year ago. He's gotten more playing time. He looks like he's starting to kind of feel this out. What's what's kind of like your read on like what Hunter Salas could be going into next year? And then also, who is there someone else on the roster right now that you see as like a that you're excited to kind of see them grow and what they could become? Yeah. Um, so for Hunter, I feel like you know a lot of people have claimed that he's our our best lockdown defender on the perimeter. And I think at times he's shown, um, he's shown flashes of that for sure. There, there's also been some moments where it's like, Oh, well maybe not quite as good as people are, are making him out to be on that end. And then there's the issue of his, his jump shot um, and whether he's going to be a consistent contributor on offense at any point during his career. Mm -hmm. I think that he has all the tools necessary to become a star at Gonzaga. The question is, is he, is it, is the light bulb ever going to go off? And is, is he going to like put it all together? Because like, we're, you know, we're heading into his junior season. Um, and as of yet, <clears throat> he's still kind of like figuring it out. Um, there was definitely growth this season, you know, overall. And I think he had, especially like in the, in the UCLA game, like he showed, 
that he can be a reliable contributor um, in, in lots of ways on the court. So I'm, I'm excited for his future. I truly do think that he has all the physical attributes, um, all the skill sets to be able to become that star that we need him to be. But, um, you know, I'm going to also be patient with, with that process because it's, you know, he's grown to this point from as a freshman. And uh, I think that there's just a lot more growth to see as time progresses. And really it comes down like, you got to have an amazing off season. Like you got, you got to put, put in more, maybe more work than you did all season in the next several months um, to take that next step and become cement yourself as that starting, um, you know, guard that Gonzaga needs that lockdown defender. Um, even if your jump shot's not a hundred percent there, like he's a natural cutter. He's an amazing cutter. And, I think that there's a lot of places he could fit in uh, to the rotation offensively um, that maybe haven't quite been utilized to the highest level yet. As far as another player I see on the roster that could potentially break out, maybe like a dark horse sleeper uh, kind of player. I, I think that uh, Braden Huff, who redshirted this season, um, is a guy to keep an eye out for uh, in the next year or two. He has uh some unique skills that you know he's a front court player um but he's a stretch shooting forward and uh you know by all accounts from conversations i've had with people in the know he has been a, a godsend in private scrimmages and practices and uh out at the warehouse where john stockton has uh, historically run workouts with some of the players um he's he's been you know, an excellent player in, in those runs. I think that he has a chance to really emerge uh, next season as, a, as at least a, a contributor. And then into the year after potentially as a starter uh, with that, with the program. So it's a, it's a name to keep an eye on. All right. <clears throat> we'll wrap, we'll wrap this up. So Josh, what's something that now that you have a bit more free time, now that the season is over, what's something you're going to, uh, get back to doing a little bit more of now that we have uh there's not they're not there's not as much basketball to watch at least over the summer yeah well um i still i still have two podcasts i got the zagaholic podcast and switch everything which is kind of more of a, a national scope thing so I'll, I'll still be talking tons of college hoops mm -hmm. as the off season progresses um the fever never quite goes away um, I'm working on a project of ranking the greatest college basketball programs of all time and doing some sort of a, a run on that on the Switch Everything podcast. Um, and then on the Zegaholic side, we got a lot of conversations to go over in the next few weeks. Uh, there's rumors out that Gonzaga could potentially be invited to the Big 12, um, you know, in the next realignment chapter. And, uh, so yeah, I, to be honest, like I have no life. I'm, I'm all about my family and college basketball. That's pretty much it for me. <laughs> hey, say, Hey, two, uh, two pretty good things to, to be completely focused on. All right. Yeah. Uh, Josh, thanks for hanging out. Thanks for chatting some, uh, Gonzaga basketball with us and, uh, we'll catch up, uh, at some point during the off season. Thanks for having me, Zach. All right. So. Now that we're wrapping up the season, now that we're getting close to the end, or that we are at the end, I'm going to give some final grades for each of the 10 teams, and I'll go through this pretty quickly um, and then wrap it up. But before I do that, I do want to, again, say I want to thank all of my guests throughout the course of the season. Uh, we'll, we will continue to do more um, episodes throughout the course of the off offseason. Uh, they will be a little bit more infrequent. Uh, than we have had during the season. Obviously, we've been doing on a weekly basis during. It'll probably be a little bit closer to every like two or three weeks during the off season. So we'll start building toward next season. Let's do some. Uh, we'll take a look at the NBA draft. We'll take a look at the portal and all that sort of stuff in the off season. So I do want to thank all of you who have who have listened over the course of the year. I want to thank all of you who I've gotten a chance to meet and I've really enjoyed getting. Uh, engaging with you on Twitter, talking with some of you um, at games and everything else. It's been a great season. Uh, so I'm looking forward to next year already. I'm excited to <laughs> already excited, looking forward to next October, November, when we can get back into basketball and really start to see some of this action and how these teams are going to play out. 
All right. So final grades. And I'll start with the the last and final grade of the team leaving the WCC, and that's BYU. And for BYU this year, I'm going I I have them as a B minus. And I say B minus because I think the expectations were relatively low for this team. And standings wise, they kind of met the expectation. Like a, I think a lot of people thought that they would be right around the fifth spot. I think that's where I had them was fifth, fourth or fifth. And and they just didn't they were good enough to not be good enough. And I think that was the frustrating thing for BYU all year long is that they played so many close games, so many and so many games in which they should have won, could have won, and they didn't for for various reasons. I don't think we got to see a whole lot of growth out of out of the guys on this team. I think that was the other maybe disappointing thing is that I don't know if I if if we saw a ton of growth from any of the players on this squad and Rudy uh, Rudy Williams kind of was exactly what we thought he was. Uh, I Fus Traore was exactly what we thought he was. I we didn't maybe a little bit of growth out of Spencer Johnson when he came back and had to be more of that guy. Um, so it was good to see him kind of step into that role a little bit. Dallin Hall had ups and downs as you would expect from a freshman. Uh, we did get to see some great things from him, but we also got to see some not so great things from him. I Gideon George, I think was a, he was a fine player, but he's not, Again, we talked about this BYU team. It's like they lacked a number one. They didn't have a number one. I don't even think they had a number two. Uh, when you think about teams, what you need to be successful and be a very good team, BYU just was missing those components. They had a lot of great role players, a lot of great guys you need uh, to have a winning program and have a winning team. But they were just missing your like your like leaders, your the guys who are going to take over the game, the guys you scout, you really like uh, put in your scout team for. Like that was what they were missing. So B minus feels about right for BYU. I'm going through these alphabetically. So as what, so just an FYI, as you start to hear the names. Uh, Gonz- Next is Gonzaga. This is an A. You get to the Elite Eight, it's an A. And yes, you can nitpick about guard play and the fact that uh, down the stretch, they really didn't. They really didn't show up all that well. Nolan Hickman, Rashir Bolton, but but the grand scheme of things, the end of the day, they shared a regular season title with St. Mary's. They won the tournament title. They had some. They had a great um, non conference schedule, and they did very well in that. They one of those games. What they did beat the team that ended up being the number one overall seed in the tournament. In Alabama, and they finished in the Elite Eight again. Like I can't emphasize the, that enough. Of like when you get this far, it's an A, especially when the expectations mid year, maybe even like early on in the year, weren't as high as they had been in previous years. Last year was definitely a championship or bust year. This year was uh, expectations were quelled a little bit, but hey, you get this far and. There's, there's no, you can't, you can't minimize the achievement that getting this far is. LMU. LMU gets an A for me. LMU is an A because of where we all thought they would be um, at the beginning of the year. A lot of us, myself included, had them as ninth and they ended up being one of the better teams in the league. They ended up with the four seed. They beat Gonzaga. They beat St. Mary's. They beat BYU. The only team, only WCC team that has ever been able to do that in one year and will likely be the only one ever to be able to do it with BYU leaving uh, the league. The coaching job Stan Johnson did, I thought was incredible. Uh, uh, I'm blanking up. Cam Shelton was, had a great, great year. He, 
he was one of the more terrifying players in the league because he could just absolutely take over a game. Uh, we got to see this team be healthy for the most part, and we saw what they were capable of when that happened. And I think that's the that's the key point. Like we saw them rebound from an awful, awful year a year ago, and be one of the better teams in this league and be one of the more more threatening and more dangerous teams in this league. So LMU gets an A for me. Pacific. Kind of similar on that expectation front. Um I'm giving them like a B, B minus uh, because they were also picked. They were picked to finish dead last and they didn't. Now they did end up still finishing in seventh, but they played a lot better and played a lot with, they ended up being a much better team than all of us thought they would be. They were in, in amongst the tiebreaker scenarios that they could have ended up being fourth. They could have ended up being fifth. Um, and a game here or two swings all of that in, for Pacific, but they ended up in seventh. I thought they they really started. To, they are piecing it back together. They were a gritty, gritty team. They, um, Kalen Boone had a great year. Um, this is a team I think that Leonard Perry is starting to kind of build in his mold a little bit more of what we saw under Damon Stoudemire. This is going to be, I think, this is going to be an interesting team to watch moving forward. Um, but yeah, solid, solid B, B minus. That's what I have for Pacific. Pepperdine. Well, I think there's no other, there's no sugarcoating this one. This is an F and it's not about individual performances because individual performances, I mean, Javon Porter had a great year. Max Lewis had a really good year. Uh, Houston Millette and Mike Mitchell had solid years. Like you can point to any number of guys that had good performances but the bottom line is this team finished in last and had and there were a lot of expectations for this team coming out of the summer there were a lot of expectations going into the fall and they met none of them and with the team with this much talent that should not be the case they shouldn't this is not a team that sh this should ha be happening to and it's going to be interesting going in the next year because we already know that you have three starters that will be leaving Mike Mitchell uh, Jr. and uh, Carson Basham have already um, inserted their name into the portal. Uh, Max Lewis has already entered his name into the draft. So this is, it's going to be a, I think it's going to be a rough off season for Pepperdine. We'll keep an eye on them, but it was, a, nothing went right for that team. And it's, it's going to be a uphill climb for them going into next year. All right, Portland. Portland. Portland is an incomplete to, for me because this team was so banged up all year long that they never had their entire lineup the way they wanted it to at any point. There were brief moments of it when they finally actually had Mike Meadows and Tyler Robertson and um and and Woods like all all on the floor at the same time, but that was few and far between. And so this became just a hard, hard year. And I think the expectations changed when looking at Portland. So I think a lot of teams went in with a little bit more. There was less overlooking of this team than a year ago. And and I think we saw that. I mean, we still saw what Portland was capable of at times. I think mean, they were still one of the more dangerous shooting teams in the league. Uh, but this was a team I felt that, like, I, we never got to see what they really could be. And next year it's going to look different. So we'll. So I'm excited to kind of see what uh, Shantae Leggins has going in the next year and what that's going to look like for this Portland team that – that hopefully can stay healthy and we can get a better idea of what, what that program is going to look like going forward. St. Mary's. This is an A second straight five seed um, in the NCAA tournament. They shared the regular season title with Gonzaga. They did beat Gonzaga for the second consecutive year uh, in Moraga. You had great performances. Logan, you can talk about Logan Johnson, Aiden Mahaney, Mitchell Saxon. Um, I, I'm, 
still would have loved to have seen that game against UConn with Alex Dukas. I don't know if he would have made a ton of difference in that second half, but it does feel like that game would have been a lot different had he been healthy. Um, but again, like you take the season in totality. You think about what this team was able to accomplish, the seed they had. They did win another game in the NCAA tournament. And yeah, this this program, much like Gonzaga, is, I think, in a very good spot. They're moving in the right direction. Uh, and you can't take away how special some of the accomplishments were of what they did. Uh, would it even be better if they had advanced to the sweet 16? Of course it would have. And maybe they didn't quite meet my expectations on that front. I thought they were a second weekend team, but it's always matchups and UConn, as we have seen, is probably going to be a terrible matchup for everybody. So I don't think you can take that much away you can't use that game as something to take away from the, what this team accomplished. This, uh, that St. Mary's team, it's that's an A for me. San Diego. This, there's a lot to unpack with San Diego. San Diego was, you bring in Steve Lavin, new head coach, a well established name. The roster almost has a complete overhaul. You have only, I think it was like three returning players from the, the prior year. So this was going to be a work in progress. And the work in progress really was a work in progress almost all year long. Uh, this team just did ne never really put together a solid stretch of games. They never really started to figure it out. They could score a bunch, but they did not play defense well. They did not. They just, and they also couldn't stay healthy. So this was a lot, there were a lot of different things happening with this team that just made it hard for this team to get any level of consistency. And so for me, also, cause like there were some weirdly high expectations for this team, which I thought was odd on the external front. But with that said, just thinking about where they finished, they finished in eighth and, or sorry, they finished in ninth. And just thinking about where this team was, what we thought they might be going into this year. I mean, they didn't meet expectations, but they didn't, didn't. They were also not what I thought they would be either. I thought that they would be at least a little bit more competitive than they were. Uh, so for any number of reasons I have, this is a C minus to me. This is a C minus. USF. I was thinking initially because of where they were because a year ago that maybe I was going to put them lower than I am, but I thought it over and I was thinking about USF and they, this is a team that still won 20 plus games and still was able to put together a pretty solid season. They got to the WCC semis and, and played, I thought really well against Gonzaga, at least for a little bit before it, uh, before that all came apart and they, the game against Santa Clara was an all time, all timer. That was a great, great game. So I say all of that. USF have got to be from, for me, this was a, another solid season, another 20 win season for USF. I think that was a, that's a really good accomplishment for a team coming off of a tournament, a tournament appearance where they lost four starters. You have a new head coach, so there's a, a lot of question marks and they could have completely fallen off the table. A lot of programs might have, but they, but USF didn't. And they were right in the mix with everybody else. They were really competitive. They were inconsistent for sure. But I think like this team overall grand scope, this is a B. And I think that's, th this is a team that should be really proud of what they were able to accomplish uh, this year with everything that, um, that changed in the off season. I think now speaking of changes in the off season to a team that maybe surprised a lot, in, may, including me, Santa Clara, Santa Clara, I'm giving an a minus because this Santa Clara team lost Jalen Williams, PJ pipes, Joseph Brankage, 
and won more games the year with the year after without them than they did with them. This Santa Clara team went from Jalen Williams to Brandon Pajemski and didn't miss a beat. And I think that says a lot about what Herb Sendek is building at Santa Clara. I think that says a lot about what the quality of players that they that he is bringing in. I think this says a lot about this the leadership that this team had this year. They got to a second straight NIT. I do think they should have won an NIT game this year, which is why there's the minus, not just a solid A. But this this is Santa Clara team. Ex, I think exceeded expectations. I think that they really played. They really played well all year long. They had, and they were competitive. I think for the most part with some of the better teams in the league. Now, like the last game against Santa Clara, and uh, sorry, Santa Clara's last game against both St. Mary's and Gonzaga did not go well for her in either of those games. But this was a Santa Clara team and again. They took care of business against everybody else. And that's part of what you have to do to remain consistent in this league is you have to beat who you're supposed to beat. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, So this Santa Clara team looks like it's on, it's, it's trending upward. We will see what, if Brandon Pajemski does return uh, for next season, still, so got to see how that process all goes. And we'll be talking about all of that as we kind of move uh, forward into the off season. So quick review, BYU, B minus Gonzaga, A, LMU, A, uh, Pacific B, Pepperdine F, Portland C, St. Mary's A, USD, or sorry, Portland incomplete. I sorry, I wrote, I think I changed my grade here. Uh, Portland incomplete, St. Mary's A, USD, C minus, USF B, and Santa Clara, A minus. All right, so that's just my quick rating of everybody in the WCC. Uh, So that will wrap up this episode of the unofficial WCC Hoops podcast. We are at a close of the 2023 season. Uh, Again, there will be more episodes throughout the course of the offseason. We'll talk about the portal. We'll talk about uh, roster construction. We'll talk about uh, what the draft looks like. We'll talk about any number of things uh, as that are going to be related to what we start to see in the in in the out of conference, what next season is going to start to look like, and all that good stuff. So, uh, again, thank you all for listening throughout the course of the season. I hope you stay stick around for uh, the off season talk and everything else. Uh, be sure to you can still engage with me on Twitter or TikTok. You can still engage with me, uh, like. Uh, by responding, leaving comments or whatnot on on the podcast sites. Uh, so, again, follow me on Twitter at Post by Zach. You can go to TikTok at Post by Zach. Uh, subscribe on YouTube and all the other channels. Uh, we'll continue to put out content throughout the course of the off season. Um, and until until next time, if I don't, if you stick around for the off season. Great. I will I will see you in a couple of weeks. If not, uh, I will see you in no, October, November for the start of the 2023-24 season. I'm Zach Farmer. Talk to you later.